if you do what you do, what we have a saying, we say, show people that you care about them by actually caring about them. Yep. And when you do that, referrals come in without you soliciting it. We don't have a referral program per se. We just have people texting us say, hey, can I connect you with my cousin, my uncle, my friends? They want to get started in this. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. This is the podcast where we talk about how to raise private money for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. I also have amazing guests that join me here on the show where I interview them and talk about how they go about raising private money for their real estate deals. Well, today I've got another amazing guest. In fact, this is a sister duo team, if you will, and they are obsessed with all things that are financial freedom. They're obsessed with passive income. They're obsessed with apartment investing and also syndication, going about this, not using any of their own money, but raising private money. And listen to this. They turned a $2,000 bank account into a nine figure empire and they're going to share with you exactly how they've done it. Now, background on them, back in 2010, they were actually really, really successful fashion manufacturers, and they were really doing really, really well, in fact. But then in 2017, something happened, right? Their biggest client that was buying their merchandise announced they were closing every one of their stores. And just like that overnight, their income dried up completely. Well, they had no backup plan. Like me, I had all my eggs in one basket before I learned about private money. And it was in that pivotal moment, they realized that their sense of security actually was an illusion at that time. They were trading time for money. And without any demand, their business became obsolete overnight. Well, they had to act fast. This was their pivotal point. They immersed themselves in this whole new world about apartment syndication to actually free themselves from the daily grind and to give them stability, reliability, and scalability in their next venture. What they're doing now allows them unlimited freedom to travel and explore their dreams and live the life that they want to be living. I know you want to hear from this dynamic duo in just a moment. You're going to meet the Kitty sisters, Palmy and Nancy Kitty, right after this. The Kitty Sisters, oh my lands, Palmy and Nancy, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Well, thanks so much, Dave. We're really excited to be here. Yep. <laughs> I think I can tell. I mean, you all are like bubbling with excitement. So just in case you missed her names, this is Palmy and Nancy Kitty. They actually are sisters and they have raised over 100 $30 million, over $130 million in funding for their deals and their transactions. And we want to dissect that. Now, first of all, you all's background, you all are first generation immigrants, right? Here to the United States. Yep. Where did you all move from and how did that come about? <laughs> um, we moved, we're Thai, so we're from Thailand um, originally. So our parents moved here first, um, wanted to really just live that American dream. And so they came and then they said like, Hey, once they started establishing some footings, they said like, Hey, let's, let's bring us over. And, and then here we are. <laughs> well, I know part of your background story is you watched your parents mm -hmm. just work hard, work hard, work hard. What was the motivation for you two sisters to go out on your own and and become entrepreneurs? Where did that come from? 
I think we were raised to become entrepreneurs because our parents are entrepreneurs. But the difference is we understand that, hey, if we continue to trade a lot of our time for a little money, it's not sustainable. And we see that with our parents where, you know, they sacrifice so much, like, you know, the time that they have with us so that they can be our provider. But at the end, if they don't learn how to grow their income in addition to that active income and grow like passive income, or even learn how to use other people's money to grow their income, they will have to work until they die. But obviously the, the happy ending is that they didn't have to do that, right? They, they have us, so. The other yeah. thing, the other thing that we saw differently, the reason why we wanted to do our own thing was because we realized that while they were successful business owners in their own right, not having, you know, the English background coming to a brand new country, I think what they've accomplished is really amazing. The The problem with the way they were doing things was that it was it was all eggs in one basket. And the other part is like it was all based on their efforts. The minute that they couldn't do it or their client shifted similar to our story at the beginning is that's it right and the other problem is like like nan said they were spending so much time in the business that they didn't have time for us all the time we kept, hear, kept hearing the phrase like i don't have time i don't have time i don't, I don't have, have time, time for to, this for that for anything to, to go to our basketball games to go to like attend school functions none of those were were part of our childhood and that also caused like um we have like we don't have as close a connection with them as we wish we would because all the years that they were giving us um, the life that they thought they were not participants in that life. It sounds to me like your experience in growing up with your parents, work, 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 work. I don't have time to do this with you. I don't have time to do that with you. It sounds like that motivated you to, to create a different experience, right? Definitely. Yeah. And that's a, because we, we know that this story isn't unique to us, that a lot of people experience the same kind of problem because their parents felt like first and foremost, when you come to a new country, the, the, the reason they chose to come because they want to have provide a better life for their family. And so that was their main focus. Um, anything else was just luxury that they didn't, we couldn't, we couldn't have. Um, so we actually thought that we were doing the right thing when we were in the fashion business, but we actually ended up falling into that same trap because we didn't have a ability to separate our income from time. Mm -hmm. And so like you said at the beginning, so eloquently, like it just went like, you know, we lost it all. So you started as entrepreneurs in the fashion industry. So yeah. I want to hear the story. How in the world did you get into the fashion industry and when you lost your business uh, overnight because you had all of your eggs in one basket, one one primary buyer, how in the world did you migrate from fashion to real estate? <laughs> Take us back to that. Yeah, I know. A lot of people can't imagine too, like how like two girls who has no real estate background and start doing real estate, right? But um, Paul, you want to take this? I mean, basically <laughs> it was we in the back of our minds, we thought like real estate is something that we keep hearing like rich people do. When you have money, you go buy real estate. But our parents were very against it. Like when we first even mentioned like a single family rental, like when we were doing fashion, they would say, why are you going to buy a rental property when you cash for like three to 300 bucks? Wouldn't it make more sense to go do a business that will produce way more income? And that was our original mindset. We thought like, okay, when you invest in real estate, it's really, really for the long run where you're not really making money. And so like, so, when, so how did we, how, how did we get into real estate? How did we even get into fashion? So basically it was sort of like um, the fa the family line of business. And we were introduced to a buyer and um, she asked for us to produce something that we actually didn't know how at the time. So we kind of fell into the business because our parents are already in fashion. But real estate is a career that we decide that this is where we want to go. So how did we decide on real estate? Because we feel that fashion is fast pace and it's always ever changing like one day you're in and the next day you're out so we're thinking of like hey we're looking for a career path where we can have longevity and no outsourcing and some something that hey it cannot be outsourced and COVID-19 kind of have taught us that we're in the right field mm -hmm. because the world was ordered to stay at home right they, they didn't order to like hey go stay at a hotel or, or resort or somewhere else so for us we're like okay so real estate is the real deal. Yeah. So when you started in real estate, 
did you start out by raising money for real estate? And here's why I asked the question. Yeah. I started back in 2003. I'm not sure you all were born in 2003, but anyway, I started in 2003 investing in single family houses here in Eastern North Carolina. My first six years, I relied on the local bank to fund my deals. And then in 2009, everything fell apart. I lost my lines of credit at the bank. I had to find a better and quicker way to fund my deals. Hence, private money. And that's when I started raising private money. And I've used private money ever since 2009 to fund my real estate deals. So how about you all? You all are in apartments, syndications, you know, raising money for apartments. Did you start out in apartments? Did you start out raising money for uh, apartment deals? How did you get started in real estate? And did private money play a part in it in the very beginning? Yes. So great question, Jay. So basically, um, when we had to shut down our fashion career, we kind of think among ourselves, like, what's our next move? And then we somehow stumble on like, um, like a conference about real estate. And that's how we kind of got into real estate. But it wasn't always apartment. It was it started off as single family flipping. And we start doing some kind of like some renovation, some flipping, and it was making great active income. So, but, but still, it didn't answer our question of like, hey, how to create another source of income, which is also passive income. Yeah. And Jay, like a funny story, like, wow, today we can confidently say that we're very good at raising money. When we first started out with flipping houses, we were terrible at it. And we were actually petrified to ask people for money because we thought we were asking them for, for money. money. So we didn't... At very beginning first couple of deals we actually try to bootleg it ourselves which we live in los angeles and home prices in LA, even that back then was very high so almost a million dollars yeah just, just to like tear it down so we 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 how we did it back then was we use hard money lending like most flippers do and then we supplement that with our own cash um but we also realized that wasn't scalable so that was our first hint like we're not doing this correctly because there's only a limited amount of homes we can buy if if that was our mode. But at the same time, we were still really afraid of raising money. It was a very, we, we didn't have rich friends or rich family members that we can go to and say like, hey, aunt, like, can you just, you want to put in half a million dollars into even that single family flip? So that was a diff, that was, it was something that was an eye opener that we knew we had to develop that skill, but it was just also at the same time, very foreign to us. So that's how we, that's how we got started in real estate as active uh, making income from this was flipping houses we did about nine houses um in, in a well, couple uh, years yeah along the along the way like we got introduced into multifamily because there are people who are now like us apartment syndicator who's like hey i have this opportunity would you like to become like our passive investor mm -hmm. and we're like okay tell us more and then all the benefit outweigh all like any questions we have about it and then when we first invest our like in our first deal we got this huge tax saving like um benefit and we we're like oh my god this is real this is something where i can just you know file it and like it goes it it um it offset my income right it's like our income so we're like okay we want more yeah so that's like our first little bit of like even for ourselves to be like oh, someone else uses our money to invest in large apartments i love it i love it so what are some really, really important lessons you've learned when you started raising private money that you don't do it that way anymore? It's like, oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. So in other words, what are some of the common mistakes that you see real estate investors when they're brand new to raising private money? What are those mistakes? What are the lessons learned and how should they go about it? Yeah, I think the first thing that we learn ourselves um, is you have to have the right mindset that what we what we said earlier, we used to think that we were asking people for money. In fact, you're never in if you have an opportunity, an investment opportunity that actually will make them a lot of money passively. You're never asking them for money. In fact, you're giving them an opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have so that they can actually earn money while they're doing their work, doing their business, living their, their life, or their money is just sitting idle at the bank, not making, you know, that high of interest. Right. So, so that was the first lesson that we learned is like, number one, we're not, we're, we're never begging. We're never asking. We're giving them an opportunity. That mindset shift was the biggest thing for us. The second one is at the very beginning, when we were raising money, our first multifamily deal, we raised three plus million dollars. Um, it was really difficult 
the reason it was difficult is, you know, the, there's a common saying in real estate, you have to find the deal, find the money, but we weren't finding the money at the beginning. We were just trying to get deals. And then the minute that those two things collided and it actually became real, we were shocked. Like, we were in trouble because we're like, even oh. though we, we knew that, even though we wanted that deal. And even though we know that, um, it, we need to do the funding, but we're like, we just wanted the deal. We didn't work on the money. No, we at didn't all. add, we didn't add people to our investor list. We didn't start cultivating relationships. We didn't have the system, like, you know, any strategy. We were yeah. just like, duct tape, piecemealing everything together and, you know, just brute force and just trying to get so it done. So anyone who's getting and started in real estate right now, I would, we would definitely recommend that you start right now. If you're serious about getting into real estate, really understand that you need to start building your investor list today. You don't wait till you have a deal to start. You start today. Oh my lands, Kitty sisters. I am so happy to have you on this show because you all go about it exactly the way I go about it, for goodness sakes. You know what drives me crazy? Just to go along with what you're saying. This drives me stupid crazy. I know you all have heard it. I know you all have heard it a hundred <laughs> times plus. I'm getting ready to say it. You already know what I'm getting ready to say. And it drives me crazy. These gurus that get on stage in the platform and they'll say, Oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and I want to go, where is the money going to show up? Is it just going to like, you know, rain out of clouds? <laughs> you know, I know you all can relate to this. Desperation has got a smell to it. Mm. Desperation has got a smell to it. The worst time in the world to be raising private money and capital is when you need it for a deal, right? I mean, you know, I just don't want to go putting a deal in a contract, whether it's an apartment, a single family house, it don't matter. And I don't have a clue where the money's coming from. Mm. And, you know, that's that. And, and, you know, you all are like maybe one of two other guests I've had out of over 600 guests wow. that have got the same philosophy that I do. And that is, this is not about asking, begging, chasing, selling, persuading. It's all about leading with a servant's heart. You know, Carol Joy, my wife and I, we've got 47 private lenders right now, 47 individuals that are funding our deals, loaning us money on our deals. And you know what? Not one of them had ever heard of private money. Not, they'd never heard of self-directed IRAs and how they can actually use their retirement funds over half of them are using their retirement funds that they can transfer over to a self-directed IRA company and then invest with us and their returns are tax deferred or tax free. And so I am so happy to have you on the show because, you know, you said it already. People ask me all the time, Jay, how do you get started? What's the, how do I get started raising private money? And you said it already, Kitty sisters, you got to own the real estate between your ears before you can actually own any real estate. And part of owning that real estate is we're not asking, begging, chasing, persuading, or selling. We're actually offering that opportunity, creating opportunity. You know, you know, when I was borrowing money from the bank, I had to go get on my hands and knees and put my hand underneath my chin and say, please fund my deal and do applications and raise my skirt up so the <laughs> bank could see my personal financial assets and see all my personal information, you know. But in this world of private money, there are no financial uh, financial statements. There's no credit scores. Uh, in fact, in this world of single family houses, I always bring home a big check when I buy uh, using private money without not ever having to even take my own down payment. So you all have raised over $130 million in private money. What are your favorite ways to raise private money and to get the word out? Yeah, I mean, like what what we learn over time was we we created a really awesome system and we call it the investor attraction flywheel. So that means that instead of us having to go out and uh, we used to talk to people just one on one, making that one on one connection. But you can hit and miss. Right. If you go to like a real estate event, maybe there's 30 people there. 
out of that, maybe there's one person that's a potential, but think about how much time and effort you spent on just trying to build that relationship. And one-to-one -one is important because real estate is still, um, investing is still, we think is still a, like a very interpersonal business. They have to trust, know, like, and trust us. But at the beginning, I think that we've established that, hey, how, how can we make this like a bigger net um, draw in more people. And that's what we've been doing lately where we're able to like um, utilize social media and, and just network on uh, internet in general to have people magnetically come to us where where people who who know who have the same kind of like ethos have some similar beliefs. They actually are attracted to our message because um, like so a person who may want to invest with Jay may not want to invest with Palm and I, right? So it's just like whatever that person, like whoever that person is for you, like the reason we're able to invest, uh, raise more money now is because instead of chasing those one and one relationship, they're just coming to us. And so from that point, then we can build the relationship with the right people. So let's, let's dive down into that. I mean, specifically, I heard you say you're using social media. So how would you break that down if someone were going to start you know, doing what you're doing, what would be step one, step two, step three, you know, what are you sharing on social media to get people attracted to you that want to do business with you? Yeah, I think on social media, the key here is you have to be your authentic self. A lot of times on social media, you see people like bling out having Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and maybe that's the type of audience they want to attract, but that's not who we are. The message, the mission needs to really be consistent with what we, how we show up every single day. What we try to do on our platforms is really show that we're experts, but also show that we're people of character. So you mix kind of both. You want to give some information where it's like, hey, this is this is what educate people. Like this is why multifamily or real estate is important. Um, maybe it's someone who was in the real uh, the stock world or never really understood high level real estate investing. So we're educating the public in general, but at the same time, like it it needs to also show us as as human beings what what we like, what we don't like. Uh, a lot of time when we first started our podcast, in fact, or even our YouTube channel, or even our YouTube channel, the cool thing is once people schedule calls with us, they actually know us already they know what we like they even tease us about our favorite drinks or like the kind of cake that we have red velvet cake so there was a funny story oh that. that's my wife's favorite cake red <laughs> velvet cake yes. yes yes we have the same and like the funniest story is nan was at an event once and there was this person from hawaii he came over and he said, Nan, I got you a bunch of bacon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, well, I know you like bacon. <laughs> here's, your, here's snacks. And so it's hilarious. But like those kind of moments, not just business talk, allow people to really like feel like they can connect with you. Yeah. So you have to learn how to find your voice and then how to, and then you're going to learn how to build your tribe. And then by serving your tribe, you'll be able to help them even more. Right. Like instead of just like helping them um, just psychologically, uh, like mentally or psychologically, you can actually help change their financial future life with their family. Yeah. And like the 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 tip to like how to do social media, Gary Vandichuk had a book a long time ago. I think it's called Jab, Jab, Punch. And what that means is give, 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 and then maybe ask. Give way more than ask. Over give. Don't ever feel like, oh, I'm giving too much of my information. No. If you don't have the best stuff and you're not willing to give it for free, then you don't have enough. Then you're not an expert. I love it. I love it. Lead with value first. You know, one word you said a moment ago in the story you were sharing is that you lead with education, educating people. Guess what? We got <laughs> something else in common. I got my private money teacher hat, right? <laughs> so I'm a private money teacher. So we're educating, leading with education, uh, you know, with people in our network. Now, for the audience here that wants to follow you on social media and see all this value that you're giving on social how can they follow you on social media? Yeah, so the Kitty Sisters were on YouTube, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, uh, trying TikTok, not <laughs> awesome yet, but we'll get there. And then um, uh, Pinterest and our podcast, you can just search us. All right, so for those of you that are listening, all this is in the show notes, but the Kitty Sisters is spelled K-I-T-T-I, -T -T -I, uh, their website, is www.thekittysisters.com, T-H-E, kitty, K-I-T-T-I, sisters.com. 
all my lands. I have got to follow you all on social media. No wonder you have got people chasing you with your all's dynamic personalities. You're leading with a servant's heart. You're teaching other people. You're creating all these win-win scenarios. So let me ask you this. Does it take, for someone that's, you know, wanting to raise capital for their deals, does it take a large network? Uh, is it necessary? Is a large network necessary to begin raising capital? I think that's one of the biggest myth is that you need to have like a large network or you have to have wealthy connection, right? Yeah. So think about this. Like we're not selling trinkets. We're not selling a pack of gum. We're not, our investments in real estate does take quite a bit of money. So if you do the math, for instance, most of our deals, the minimum is $75,000. Similarly, if you're going to buy a single family fit, it's probably, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, $50,000. So let's say for us, if we were um, raising a million dollars and we're doing a hundred thousand minimum, we only need 10 people. So while we're heavy on social media, we don't need to have a million followers to be able to raise millions of dollars. In fact, um, we didn't have a massive list and we still don't have a massive list compared to like what you think like influencers who have like millions of followers. But like I said, because of the math, because of what we do, we don't need that many people. And the awesome thing, Jay, is that if you do what you do, what we have a saying, we say, show people that you care about them by actually caring about them. Yep. And when you do that, referrals come in without you soliciting it. We don't have a referral program per se. We just have people texting us say, hey, can I connect you with my cousin, my uncle, my friends? They want to get started in this. Absolutely. I experienced the same thing. In fact, uh, you probably got the same problem I do. And that is you got more private money than you can put to work. <laughs> yeah. Especially right now in 2024. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Now I got one more question for you before we wrap it up. And that is, I get asked this question all the time by new real estate investors. Here's the question. And then I want you to answer it. They ask me all the time. They say, Jay, who in the world is going to loan me private money? And I've never done a deal. I don't have a track record. I know what I'm doing. I'm confident what I'm doing, but you know, do I really need a track record in order to begin raising capital? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, our answer is no. And why? We are the like the the proof that you don't need to have a track record to raise your money. Like our first deal, like Palm said earlier, we raised three point nine million dollars. And of course, like we didn't have like years of experience of apartment investing. But what we say is like, hey, even though we're new but our team aren't new, right? Like our team is um, like our attorneys aren't new, our pro property manager aren't new, our instruction, lenders, lawyers. So real estate is a really team sport. We can never do this by ourselves. Yep. And so the we don't wanna be the smartest or the best at anything in that, in any given room in real estate. What we want is we wanna hire or partner up with people who are better than us, who are expert, who have, decades of experience and so yeah so, and so we, we may be new but they're not new and mm -hmm. we just lean onto their track record and their experience and say hey this is the business plan we have a deal this is a business plan and these are the people who will be executing on a daily basis which is our property management team who have like ten thousand door under their belt and this is their track record. And the other thing that I want to emphasize for everyone is like, don't discount what you're already doing right now. You may be a business owner today. Maybe you are working for another person or have a, a job, but those skills are all transferable. Organization, communication, understanding business plan, projecting things out. Those skills are all transferable to real estate. And so you have to give yourself that grace and credit for whatever you are already doing successfully right now. And just know like, and, and be able to articulate that to your, the potential investors. I'm new to real estate, but I'm not new, right? I wasn't born yesterday. I absolutely know how to do this. We ran two successful multi-million for us. We ran two successful multi-million dollar businesses before we got into apartments. And we are just smart enough to bring a whole bunch of people that will Even help smarter than us. Our, yeah, they're experts in every little part of our business. So what we like to say is whatever you're missing in your ability, we always leverage. You have to learn how to leverage. Yeah. If you are listening to this podcast, there is a ride or downer, particularly if you're brand new. Quote, unquote, the answer to the question, who's going to loan me private money if I'm brand new and I don't have a record? There's your answer directly from the Kitty Sisters. I may be new, 
but my team has got decades and decades of experience and I work with the best professionals in the industry. Kitty sisters, Nan, Palm, oh my lands, what an amazing, amazing interview here. Be sure and give out right now how people can connect with you, stay connected with you. I know you gave out your social media. Any other contact information that you'd like to share? Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> okay, no, you said. Yeah. If anyone out there want to say goodbye to feeling scattered, stressed, and have to last minute scramble for funds in real estate, um, feel free to join our Raise More Money Challenge that we're having coming up soon. In that case, you can really learn how to get started in this business without actually having to have a lot of your own money in the deal. And that's the, really the best way to play it. So go to raisemoremoneychallenge.com, raisemoremoneychallenge.com, and you'll be able to get information about registering. Yes. Yeah, so to join our upcoming five-day Raise More Money Challenge, all you have to do is go to raisemoremoneychallenge.com. That is raisemoremoneychallenge.com. I love it. Nance and Palm, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Jay. All right. God bless you all. Fun. Thank you. Yes. So much fun. There you have it, my friend. Another amazing, as in super amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. I appreciate you showing up and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.